So for third talk of the morning, uh, Gail Schaefer from Chara and uh, of Georgia State uh, University is going to tell us about precision astrometry using long baseline interferometry. Um, you're going to go 35 minutes and then 10 minutes for questions. So thank, take us away, Gail. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, as Eric mentioned, I'll be talking about um, uh, uh, astrometry using long baseline interferometry. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Step one, yeah. learn how to advance slides. <laughs> okay, so yesterday uh, Roxanne gave uh, uh, an introduction to interferometry. So just as a quick recap, I fear I give um, a, a quick refresher. <laughs> um, so basically interferometry, you have uh, uh, two or more telescopes looking at the <coughs> same stars um, and uh, basically uh, the, the light from the star comes in, uh, hits uh, two separate telescopes, and you bring the light together uh, to form interference fringes. Um, and basically, this uh, allows you to uh, extend uh, uh, the uh, achieve higher resolution than just a, a single telescope. <laughs> Um, and so, so basically, the, um, uh, the one important thing about forming these interference fringes is that the light from uh, that enters each telescope, in order to get your interference fringes, it has to travel the same distance uh, from the telescope into the lab to form fringes. Uh, so what we do is that the light, uh, the light comes through, and we'll arrive at one telescope before it arrives at the next one. So you add a certain amount of path de length delay to one of the arms of the interferometer uh, in order to get the fringes out. And uh, basically, if you have a radio interferometry, you can um, time tag the signals, record your data, and do the correlation of the, the uh, interference patterns after the fact. <laughs> but at optical and near infrared wavelengths, you can't time tag the signal that fast. So you have to do all the beam combination in real time. <laughs> So this is basically just an overview of how it works in practice. This is uh, the char array, which is up at Mount Wilson, uh, which you can kind of see the peak if you're in the right orientation from Pasadena. This is this here is uh, one of our one meter telescopes in the, the array. We have six of them. Uh, so the way we do the beam transport basically is that you we have vacuum pipes where the light from the telescope goes into the vacuum pipes and into this big uh, beam comb combination lab. <laughs> And this, inside the lab, we have these little carts that drive on these uh, long 40 meter long rails that uh, uh, basically track the motion of the star across the sky and equalize the path length from each telescope. <laughs> and from there, you send it to your beam combination table that actually where you do uh, the combination of the beams and you measure your interference fringes uh, with, a, with a camera. <laughs> um, and so the big advantage of going to interferometry is now that your, your, your spatial resolution of your interferometer is uh, dependent on the uh, separation or baseline between your two telescopes. Um, and so just as a, a, a rough uh, comparison for a 300 meter baseline uh, working in the H band at 1.6 microns, uh, you get basically a half a milli arc second resolution. If you go down to visible wavelengths, you can extend down to about 0.2 milli arc seconds. <laughs> for this 300 meter baseline. And so the, my talk uh, here will focus on optical and near infrared interferometry. So I just wanted to highlight that there's a, uh, uh, a nice poster by Salvador on uh, getting precision astrometry with radio interferometry. So I encourage you to go uh, uh, check out the nice work that uh, he's presenting in the, uh, the poster. So I figured I'd do a quick comparison about the spatial scales that we're examining. So uh, for Gaia, I, uh, if hopefully I got the correct number from the website, but to actually spatially resolve to see that there are, to get separate measurements from two stars, uh, you should be able to do this for uh, separation of stars about 100 milli arc seconds. Now the real power of Gaia is the precision of your position measurements, right? That you can get down to 10 micro arc second positions. So anything in here, you're basically measuring your photo center shift. Um, and the big advantage of Gaia is that it's all sky, wide angle, and absolute uh, position measurements. 
On, on the comparison for long baseline optical interferometry, if we take this figure of half a milli arc seconds and plot it in comparison, uh, well, this is just one milli arc second in com comparison to this field of view. So if you want to see a, like a basically a direct image of what you're looking at, to measure your flux ratios and separation between the stars, um, uh, this gives you a much finer scale uh, resolution. Um, and uh, you can achieve similar precision in the astrometric uh, uh, accuracy, uh, precisions, uh, but the one disadvantage of interferometry is that you're restricted to very narrow angles on the sky. So only relative interferometry, but there's a lot of synergy between the two techniques. <laughs> okay, so basically for, um, uh, if you're looking at a binary system, basically you're going to get a fringe packet from each star. <laughs> and basically the separation between the fringes gives you your projected separation of a binary star. <laughs> and as the star, uh, as, a, um, uh, as the separation gets narrower, your fringe pattern starts overlapping. Um, and so basically if you have this overlapping uh, fringe packing, it's gonna be modulated, the amplitude of your fringes is gonna be modulated by the binary separation. So measuring uh, how the contrast changes with a projected baseline, or wavelength, you can measure the, uh, uh, the separation of the binary star. And so this is just an example of how that uh, uh, your uh, contrast or visibility modulation of the fringes changes. Um, this is the visibility uh, uh, plotted across the baseline here. Um, and so basically the amplitude of your fringes for a binary system is going to um, uh, vary periodically. Uh, and this, uh, uh, basically you get two, uh, two visibility functions, one for the primary star, one for the secondary star, and they're modulated based on their separation on the sky. So if you then uh, measure the separation between the peaks in this uh, visibility modulation, you could get the binary separation on the sky. And if you measure the minimum in the visibility curve, that gives you an estimate of the flux ratio. Um, and then the field of view of an interferometer is going to depend on uh, basically the coherence length. So this, uh, uh, the wavelength square divided by the, uh, um, uh, as the band pass of your, of your instrument. Uh, so basically how this works is that each uh, wavelength of light is gonna form fringes at a slightly different position. So if you're on the central fringe, uh, the farther away you move out, uh, the, the, uh, the fringes that you form from different wavelengths are gonna interfere destructively and basically blur out your fringe pattern. So uh, this, uh, the width of your fringe packet is basically gonna depend on the spectral resolution of your interferometer. So this is just a basically a comparison of uh, two different spectral resolutions. So if you have higher spectral resolution, you'll have a wider fringe packet and basically a wider field of view on the sky. And if you have a, um, like a broadband or, or, or uh, lower resolu spectral resolution, you'll have a narrower fr fringe packet and a narrower field of view on the sky. Uh, and so these are just some typical field of views. So you get the uh, a resolution of sub milli arc second precision and a field of view of roughly, you know, somewhere between like 50 to 200 milli arc seconds on the sky. So this is just some example of binary orbits that you could do with uh, 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 interferometry. So this here is a, a, a spectroscopic binary with a 30-day uh, period and a semi-major axis of just uh, seven milli arc seconds. Um, and if you combine this uh, orbit with uh, 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 radial velocities from a double-line spectroscopic binary, you can actually get masses uh, of the two components and distances to one to three percent precision. Uh, so basically going back to uh, why we care about binary stars, which you heard a lot about over the past two days, uh, is, is that it gives you um, uh, direct masses of, of stars uh, that you can then compare to evolutionary tracks uh, and uh, test the physics that go into those evolutionary tracks um, and also get uh, uh, isochrone ages and see if the ages of the two components compare. And if you have a large collection of uh, binary stars, you can start looking at empirical relations of mass to luminosity and uh, use these relations then to, you know, get refined parameters for stars that don't have companions, uh, but you still want to know their properties very well, um, especially for exoplanet host stars. 
Um, and in, in addition to masses, you can also get uh, uh, distances uh, very accurately. So this is, uh, uh, the dis this is uh, um, mapping the orbit of a, a companion to the Cepheid star V1334 SIG. The companion itself is a uh, very high contrast. It, contrib it contributes only 3% of the light, but you get a nice uh, visual orbit of the star from interferometry. And you can com combine that with uh, radial velocity measurements to get both masses and a 1% uh, distance. Uh, to the star. And so uh, basically you can use these nearby Cepheids to calibrate the uh, period luminosity relation for Cepheids. And one of the interesting thing is this companion, even though it only contributes very uh, small amount, only 3% of the flux, um, accounting for that changes the calibration of your period luminosity law. So uh, determining the fluxes of the relative fluxes of the stars in your system uh, can have uh, important contrib contributions. <laughs> okay, and then there's also been some uh, effort to try to detect exoplanets using interferometry. Uh, so the way this works, because you have a narrow field of view, uh, you wanna have a star in your field of view that you can measure your, your relative astrometry relative to. So this uh, basically, you, this is, um, exoplanet searches in binary systems. Uh, so basically, if you just have a, a plane binary, you get a nice orbit here. But if you have a planet around one of the components, you start, start seeing this wobbling motion. And so uh, there's been some effort to try to see if you can detect uh, planets in nearby stars looking through uh, binaries. So this was some uh, preliminary work that was done at the Chara Array. Uh, and this is a uh, work by Tyler Gardner. And this was a, a binary system with a 40 day orbit, uh, about 14 milli arc seconds inside. And you get uh, very high 10 micro arc second precision on the measurements going into this. Uh, and basically uh, um, by injecting fate companions, you get to start mapping out the detection limits. And you can actually get down with this precision down to detecting um, hot Jupiters around. Uh, that are in uh, nearby binary systems. So there's, there's been um, uh, some work done on this. this they, they, there was an early survey that looked for astrometric signatures in binary systems using the Palomar testbed interferometer back in, which is uh, not in operation anymore, uh, uh, but there was the phases survey that had a sample of about, I think like 50 binaries that they were monitoring over time. And more recently, there was a, the Armada survey, which was done at both Chara and v VLTI. So the Chara array, which I mentioned before, is just up on Mount Wilson, it's an array of six uh, one meter telescopes um, uh, up on Mount Wilson. And the um, baselines range from 30 meters out to 330 uh, uh, meters in length. Um, and this uh, Armada survey was also done uh, both in the northern hemisphere using Chara and the VLTI in the south. And so the VLTI uh, can either combine the four unit telescopes, the eight meter unit telescopes of the VLTI, or um, uh, the smaller 1.8 meter um, auxiliary telescopes. And your baselines for the, the uh, unit telescopes, the maximum baseline is about one, 130 meters. And for the auxiliary telescopes, it's a maximum baseline of about 200 meters. And so for this Armada survey, they were mainly looking for uh, 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 potential exoplanets around um, uh, A and B type stars. And so this is basically the, um, uh, the, at, the, at the time, I guess, pre-Gaia pre release of uh, uh, orbital, um, the or orbit catalog. Um, basically uh, for the, um, a and B type stars, you have uh, a lot of detections using transits and direct imaging uh, with gap in between. And one of the complications with A and B type stars is that their spectral lines are often weak and broadened, which makes it more difficult to identify uh, planets through radial velocity surveys. Uh, so this Armada survey here will basically target uh, separations between these two samples of um, of uh, detections for uh, exoplanets. And so the Armada survey looked at 70 um, uh, binary systems 
and uh, with uh, the binaries range between 50 to 200 milliarc seconds. And as I mentioned before, it used uh, Chara, the Achara array in the north and VLTI uh, uh, using the gravity instrument in the south. And so this work was done by Tyler Gardner. He was a graduate student at the University of Michigan working with John Monnier, and he's now at the University of Exeter. So this is basically the sky coverage of the sample of binaries he looked at uh, the, uh, with histograms of the uh, primary and secondary masses ranging from one to three uh, solar masses um, and periods ranging from uh, a few years out to 100 years for the wide. Uh, wide separation binaries. And so this was basically a demonstration system. This is a, a known triple system, kappa peg, and the astrometric signature of kappa peg was actually detected from the, the wobble of the third companion was de detected in this phases survey by the Palomar testbed interferometer. Um, and so plot in this plot is basically all the gray circles here are uh, data points from the Washington double star catalog. And then over here in red are the, some uh, measurements with the uh, Merck X instrument at the Char array. And if you zoom in here, you can actually start seeing this very small, like milli arc second uh, signature of the wobble from the companion uh, measured with uh, interferometry. And so basically, this is a comparison of what the state of the art was uh, back of the, if you look at that wobble and just plot the orbit on the sky. This is uh, what the phases survey did. And this is compared to what you can achieve now with the Merck X instrument at uh, the char array with just uh, about four micro arc second precision on, uh, on the inner orbit of this um, hidden companion. <laughs> and so for the sample of stars that Armada, look, Armada looked at, um, you basically can uh, detect nearly all stellar mass companions to in these binary systems. Uh, you could de determine orbital elements, masses of the stars, and uh, mutual inclinations. So the relative orientation of the inner orbit to the outer orbit. So this is just a sample of some of the wider orbits. And again, these are compare compared with a Washington double star, double star catalog to give the long-term uh, map of the orbits. And then using this Armada survey to do very high precision measurements over smaller time frames, and then you can look at these are the, um, the systems that uh, a third companion was detected, and then you can go in and look at the inner systems of each of these. Uh, this one in the middle basically is a quadruple system, so you can see the wobble motion from the opposite pair imprinted in the inner orbit for that one. So the um, the the Outer periods basically range from anywhere from like 20 years out to 300 years. Um, and the inner ones range from about two days out to um, uh, a few years. <laughs> and so based on this uh, sample of 70 binaries that the Armada survey looked at, they found uh, 15 new triple detections. Uh, their uh, median precision in the astrometry was about 20 to 50 micro arc seconds. And they also found that most of the inner systems are misaligned relative to the outer orbits. Now this could have something to do with that they were looking at um, more massive stars or A and B type stars, and maybe they undergo more dynamical interactions in the lifetime. It could also be an effect of the way they selected the orbits that they were um, uh, you know, preferentially selecting systems that are more likely to be misaligned. Um, so in this, the, the main objective of the survey was to see if they could detect companions. So they did get um, uh, um, exoplanet companions. They did get um, two possible substellar candidates from uh, uh, the, the Char array. Uh, both are, uh, are around eight type binaries with about 50 uh, Jupiter mass, so substellar at least. Uh, but these need, uh, uh, you, you can see the inner orbits here are kind of um, not as clean as some of the stellar mass companions. Uh, so they need uh, um, astrometry to uh, confirm these uh, or high precision RVs. <laughs> okay, and so the Armada survey basically look at binaries within the interferometric field of view. And you can actually extend interferometry to go outside of your, your uh, 
narrow angle field of view uh, by doing a dual field mode. So um, uh, this is where you have two stars and you separate the light out between the two stars and you send them to two different beam combiners. And basically the relative offset between the fringe pattern between the two combiners um, will give you your, your um, relative position measurement on the sky. And so the gravity instrument at VLTI uh, actually has this mode as a cap capability. Um, and you can extend the field of view out to uh, about two arc seconds with the unit telescopes and about four arc seconds to the auxiliary telescopes. And there's a new gravity wide mode that actually extends the field of view out further to about 30 arc seconds. So I figured I'd give you a brief overview of some of the results that are coming out of this uh, uh, gravity dual field mode. So one of the main uh, drivers was of the gravity instrument was looking at the galactic center. And so this is basically your um, snapshot of about 50 milli arc seconds centered around the uh, uh, black hole in the center of the galaxy. So you see um, this one I think has the labels coming up on it. So Sag A star here. And you see these uh, close in orbits of the stars orbiting around the, uh, the galactic center. <laughs> And so in addition to being able to use these measurements to uh, do the, uh, determine the mass of the central black hole, you can also look at very close orbits. So this is uh, the S2 orbit, which it was actually out of the field of view in this, these images here. Um, but you can look at it with uh, the gravity at, uh, instrument at VLTI and get very high precision uh, observations uh, of the system as it's moving through periostron down here. So with the separation of just 14 milli arc seconds. And using these uh, uh, astrometric uh, position measurements with um, uh, radio velocities during this time, you can actually do uh, uh, very stringent tests on uh, general relativity, in particular measuring the gravitational redshift during, uh, during the periostron passage here. Uh, and this was just in case the movie didn't play, so we can just skip that one. <laughs> okay, and you can also do, I, I won't spend too much time on this, but you can also, um, if you have a, a, a directly imaged uh, exoplanet system, you can also phase reference on the exoplanet host star and then get uh, fringe measurements on your companion. So this is uh, H, the, one, of the, uh, one of the exoplanets in HR8799. And let's see, uh, this measurement up here is actually from VLTI gravity. Um, and in addition to measuring um, astrometry, you can also get um, a low resolution spectrum of the exoplanet itself from uh, VLTI gravity. And I won't spend much time talking about this because there'll be a lot of talks tomorrow on directly imaged planet. And uh, in particular, uh, Pierre Carvello will be talking more about uh, VLTI gravity measurements of exoplanets in his talk tomorrow. And so I, I thought I would end a little bit on uh, talking about how uh, additional synergies between uh, the results you get from interferometry and exoplanets and Gaia. So this involves imaging stellar surfaces. So actually getting detailed images of what the star looks like and how that impacts your measurements of uh, exoplanet detections and also precision in your Gaia astrometry. So uh, stars are active and they'll have star spots on them. Uh, so this was a, a program to image the surface of uh, Epsilon Eridani, which is the closest K2 main sequence star. Uh, and it also has a, a, an exoplanet host. Uh, is an, it has an exoplanet around it. Um, and so basically this was worked by Rachel Rodenbacher, who uh, was doing, um, using test photometry to get light curve inversions to map the star spots on the surface. And in addition to doing the test photometry, she got two epics uh, with the chariot array to uh, model the star spots. These were just brief snapshots. So these are actually model images and they're not direct image reconstructions, uh, but you basically see the star spot move across the surface there. <laughs> um, and basically the, the, um, your radial velocities that you measure for the exoplanet orbits are gonna be affected by the uh, exoplanet signature itself, but also any activity on the surface will affect the precision of your RVs. 
Uh, so they were able to produce an activity model based on these uh, light curve inversions of the test photometry to reduce the RMS scatter in the radial velocity and improve your detection of the planet. So you can kind of detect, disentangle the planet signature from the stellar activity. <laughs> Um, and so basically one of the limitations of light curve inversion is that you don't know the orientation of the spots on the sky um, and you don't, you're not very sensitive to the latitude of the spot either. So that's something that can be resolved uh, if you com combine the interferometry then with your light curve imaging. And you can actually know the um, inclination of the star and its orientation on the sky. And so in the case of Epsilon Iridani, you can link this then with the relative orientation of the debris disk. And you can also look at how convective spots on the surfaces of stars can impact your astrometry that you measure. So this was uh, CL LAC, which is an asymptot asymptotic giant branch star. Um, and this is a, an image reconstruction from the Char array where you can see the, um, the brightest spot on the surface is not at the center of the star. Um, and the star itself is, uh, is, is a large angular size, it's about three milli arc seconds. Um, so this position of your convective spots on your surface, especially for large uh, giant stars, can impact your, the precision that you measure for the position measurement of the stars. And so what they found was that the, um, uh, the variation of the photocenter of the star can actually account for a large amount of the error of the parallax. And you can kind of feed this back. And then for uh, asymptotic giant branch stars, you can actually look at that scatter in your, um, uh, in your Gaia parallaxes and maybe backtrack that into what's happening with the convection on the surface of the star. OK, and I, I think I finished a little early. <laughs> so I, I'll end here that um, uh, both at the Char Array and VLTI, uh, there's community access time available. So if you have any targets that you want very high resolution imaging of it, um, uh, I definitely invite you to consider submitting time for either array. Um, you know, if you want a very precise radius of your exoplanet host star, uh, that's one of the main things, as long as it's big enough, uh, we can measure diameter, um, binary orbits, stellar surface imaging, uh, circumstellar disks around stars, uh, you can probe the inner regions. And so I'll be around today and tomorrow. And uh, if you have any questions or, you know, want to uh, propose for observations with uh, uh, three interferometers, just come talk to me at some point. <laughs> Oh, and I have, um, if you want, I have chair stickers and brochures. So come talk to me. So we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, Tim? Quick one, uh, Tim Brandt. If one wanted to apply for Chara time, how much expertise would they have to have in interferometric data? So it, does it come at, to you at a point where it's basically, here's a relative position, or is there a lot of work that you would need to do to reduce the interferometry yourself? Yeah, so we, we as part of the this open access program at, at, at least at uh, Chara, and I think it's very similar also at VLTI, is that we, we try to provide as much support for users who know nothing about interferometry. So, it, um, so we have a, uh, a visitor support scientist that uh, people can uh, contact uh, while they're in the stage of writing proposals just to make sure they, they're choosing the right instrument to accomplish their science. Uh, and we usually provide, um, we do data reduction and provide calibrated OI fits files. Um, and depending on what your program is, we, we, and how much you know, we can also provide some assistance with getting you started with fitting the data too. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, very nice talk. I have a question for the imaging, the very close binary. Is there any limitation for the contrast between the two star? Is it can be used to resolve like very faint companion 
is uh, like uh, for giant planets, brown dwarf? Yes, so you're, um, the limitations are basically, um, in, in terms of uh, separation, you can get down to about the resolution limit. So half a arc second in the near infrared, about 0.2 in the visible. Uh, in terms of contrast, you can get about five to six magnitude contrast if you use um, one of the multi-beam combiners, like the Merck-X instrument that combines all six telescopes. You get very precision, precise closure phases that give you a good handle. So about uh, five to six magnitudes difference in closure phases. And I th think detecting Jupiter mass objects is probably out of reach, although there's some work to really push down on the precision of these closure phase measurements to maybe reach the hottest um, uh, hot Jupiters. <laughs> But it's um it's not an e easy um, measurement at all. So um, thank you. That was very nice talk. Um, interferometry tends to make my head hurt, but that was very clear. Um, my question was about uh, the Alpha Sun A and B system. Is um, is there there was some hints there was claims of planets around both A and B? Is is uh, VLTI is somebody at VLTI actually trying to see if try to confirm those looking for wobble in the in the binary orbit. I don't know for sure if it's an accepted program, but I think there it is either been awarded time or I think there is somebody who's looking into that with the VLTI. So I don't I don't I, I don't know as much about the VLTI programs that are in progress. Okay, thanks. Hello, Eduardo Bendek, uh, JPL. Uh, very nice talk. I'm really amazed with the performance of Chara, given that is in, in a site that is not like the VLTI. Uh, so, and the monumental task of doing fringe tracking you know, with atmospheric seeing. So, my question is can you comment a little bit on the impact of the seeing on the performance of Chara? And, what would happen if Chara would be on an amazing place like Don C or any other incredible seeing location with low frequency turbulence? Yeah, so, so your, uh, your ability to track fringes definitely uh, improves significantly if the seeing is good. Um, so, so you usually in the summer months from July through like September or so, we get pretty good seeing up on Mount Wilson. Uh, so those, those ones that you typically get fairly good measurements, but if, you know, particularly in the winter time in Southern California, where you get like storms going through, you get a lot of bad seeing. So it's, yeah, you, you can definitely, um, if you have like very faint stars that you're trying to do at the, the, the limits of the detector, if you have bad seeing, you're just not going to be able to do them very, very well or at all if the scene is very bad. Uh, we, we have started an um, a initiative to, we've been adding adaptive optics to each of the tower one meter telescopes. And the one of the main emphasis of the uh, adaptive optics program is not necessarily to improve the resolution of you know, the interferometer, because that's dependent on the baseline, but basically to improve your uh, injection into your beam combiner and make your, you know, marginal seeing nights into better seeing nights. And it, it, it's helped a lot, a lot. <laughs> Maybe one All right, so uh, this question is asked, can you use Chara uh, VLTI to search for planets around single stars when the planet is not already directly imaged? I think that's going to be difficult for single stars. I'm definitely at Chara, we can't do it because we don't have this, um, this, dual field mode. VLTI, I guess if there's a star within like 30 arc seconds or so, maybe you can start doing it. I don't, I don't you know, I, I work up at Chara, so I don't know as much about the, the VLTI um, uh, capabilities. But if there's a star within your, the small field of view, you might be able to then measure relative positions. A uh, real quick question for clarification, because I don't know if I caught it. After you were talking about the Kappa Peg result, 
you showed the substellar potential companions, the 50 Jupiter mass around the A star. Was was that published or are you teasing? Was that a tease? What was that, that was that was a tease. Okay. So you didn't, you I think did it, not I think tell us the names of the host. You did not mention the host star. No, names, and, and I, I actually I think this was a work that showed up in Tyler Gardner's thesis. So I don't even know right now the names of the stars. So this is just a plot he shared with me. So that's, that's a pretty awesome mass ratio and um, discovery. If it's, I just wanted to note that. That's so. Yeah. And he may, he might be waiting on his, the, the, his program is ongoing. So he might be waiting on additional astrometric ep, ep, um, epics to confirm. And just that's probably a very close by star. Right. Yeah. And, and okay. these are two two separate systems. So, yeah, they're they're um, uh, I don't know if I I don't think the distance is. Yeah, but they're they're fairly close by because you, you have to be able to. Angularly resolve them. I don't I don't see the distances on here, but yeah, I think it's fairly close by. Uh, the second online question is uh, which parameters are important to obtain the gravitational redshift? Oh, so the I think for the gravitational um, redshift observation, the, the uh, with the VLTI here. So I I think what this was, I I, I wasn't a part of this uh, paper or anything. So this is um, me hand waving my way through. Um, so but right here, you basically use the um, this is uh, the um, adaptive optics imaging of the outer orbit, and you use uh, the gravity instrument to get very precise. Um, orbit for the system as it passes through periosteron. And you need then to compare that very precise orbital parameters with the radial velocities that you measure during that time. And then it's the, uh, it's this spectroscopic data that then would give you your, your redshift uh, based on that you can see the offset based on this, the very precise orbit predictions. I'll take chair's prerogative and at least ask one. You had a plot that had a residual of something like four micro arc seconds. Can you show that plot again? What was that? Oh, so yeah, this, so this is the Kappa, Kappa Peg, Peg. Uh -huh. system. So this is the outer orbit, right? Uh -huh. um, and then if you, uh, so the gray symbols here are the um, position measurements from the Washington double star catalog. And these are uh, uh, position measurements from this Armada survey, so interferometric measurements. Um, and, and you can kind of see that there's a little wobble in this green orbit line here. So if you zoom in, you can see the position of the, there's a measurement here, a measurement here, doing this looping motion. So then if you subtract out the, the long period, you're left with just the orbit of the inner compa companion. So this is the basically the astrometric wobble motion of the inner pair that has the precision of four micro arcs. I'm just, say. I'm amazed at that small because now we're reaching, if I'm remembering correctly, I thought an earth twin around the alpha sen A and B uh, at maybe Eduardo can correct me or Pierre. I thought it was three micro arc seconds for an earth twin around alpha sen. So I, I hadn't seen any so, so, yeah, yet, this, this, even close to that. Yeah, this, this isn't, um, this isn't a substellar companion, right? So it, so it, it depends on the, this, it's an astrometric orbit, so it depends on your flux ratio between the size. Yeah. So, and, and I, I think the mean um, residuals for the program are more like, you know, 20 micro arc seconds. This was the, the best case. <laughs> the other thing I was going to ask, actually, a follow on to Tim's question was uh, so, as a practical matter, how, how faint targets can you go? And I'm assuming this is near infrared magnitudes. Um, yeah. So, in um, at, uh, at Chara, with the, the instrument Merck X that does uh, this very high precision um, astrometry, you can, we, we give our magnitude ranges of what you can get in typical conditions and what you get in the best seeing conditions. Um, so your typical um, seeing conditions, you get down to um, about 6.5 at H or K. And then in very good uh, conditions, you might be able to push eighth magnitude. So very bright stars. Uh, VLTI can actually go fainter with the unit telescopes and with this phase referencing mode. <laughs> so if it's a binary with an HR designation, almost certainly, if yeah. it's an HD, probably. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
Um, and and you, 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 uh, these are in infrared and you just need, uh, we do tip tilt tracking in the visible. So uh, it just has to be brighter than about 14th magnitude in B band <laughs> for the tip tilt. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's uh, thank you all again.